Welcome to the Healthy Mind Fit Body Podcast. This is episode number three, and this is your host, Kevin. And this is Wes, co-host. And I had the uh, show to myself last week, Kevin, but this week you're able to come on and we can do a show. Yeah. How have things been going on your end? Really good, actually. Uh, I've been keeping busy with not only work, but also with my fitness and uh, with my nutrition as well. Mm-hmm. Going to get in the water today? The uh, blue ocean out there in La Jolla? Yeah, I'm actually planning on going down to La Jolla Cove, which is about five miles from my house, and uh, getting in a probably a two-mile swim today. Water's been awesome. It's uh, around 72, 73 degrees, and uh, of course, we're getting perfect weather, so... Nice. Well, I think uh, it's funny. We talk about water temperature, 72 degrees. You wouldn't want to run a bath at that temperature, I don't think. Our Pacific Ocean here is about 59 degrees most of the year. And then in the summer, it warms up into the high 60s, low 70s. And when you jump in, it feels much more like a pool that's around 83 degrees than cold water. The salt water, combined with the fact that you're expecting it to be a lot colder, makes it feel nice and toasty. Yeah, yeah, you definitely get acclimated to it. On my end, I've got a tendon injury I've been working around, basically. And uh, maybe I'll write a blog post about this, about how to maintain your fitness and exercise while you have an injury, because obviously I can't really do anything involving abduction, basically flexing my tricep on my left arm. So I've got to do certain weight routines that avoid activating that pain threshold. I pretty much uh, strain the tendon to the point where I really can't use it much now. And it's going to take a few weeks to rehabilitate it. But with any injury like that, you'll have inflammation, right? So it's always good to take omega-3 fatty acids in high doses to deal with that. Yeah, no doubt. Especially as we age, it's much easier to get injured. And then it takes away a lot of the fun in day-to-day life, especially when you're active. Yes. So I've dealt with injuries myself. And uh, you know, I think more than the physical pain and discomfort and stuff, it's actually the inability to do the things you like to do that is the tough part. So the mental aspect of it is actually, for me, has been the tough part in the past. So mm-hmm. The volleyball, the beach volleyball courts have been beckoning me, but uh, I've had to forego go it, but maybe I'll get out there this week. We'll see. Yeah. But you can always find exercises to do that don't involve uh, whatever the injury is uh, healing from. So it's always good to be creative in that regard. But I think uh, this show, we're going to focus on across the pond over there in Francais. Bonjour. The French paradox, right? The French paradox. Why French women don't get fat. The book is titled French women don't get fat. Mm-hmm. And why don't they get fat? This has been a real popular thing in the media. Because she wrote this book, I think Marielle Giuliano wrote this book a few years ago, but now it's kind of being revitalized, apparently. Yeah, and I see a lot of people talking about it on Facebook and things like that. Women that are trying to you know, get in shape and lose weight, and they're following this kind of method of eating like the French. And I think it all started because... There are significantly fewer fat people in France than in America. So everybody's wondering why. I think there was a theory going around for a while that it was just the red wine. And, you know, there's obviously uh, a lot to it. So Yeah, the resveratrol, I guess, you have to take in pretty high doses to get a therapeutic effect. And it would be equivalent of drinking, you know, gallons of red wine per day in, in terms of the <laughs> supplement form. So I don't think that's a good thing to do. But... um I think even low doses, uh, some people are recommending taking that. But that's obviously not the reason why this contention is made that French women don't get fat. As a matter of fact, there is a counter uh, set of statistics to that notion by the bulletin at the AARP, which could be a questionable authority, certainly. But um, they forward some statistics that say that along with the rest of the French population, they're getting fatter. One survey found that between 2003 and 2006, obesity rates among women in France increased from 11.9 to 13.6%. Mm-hmm. Not exactly a big leap, but uh, an incremental increase nonetheless. In 2006, more than 31% of French women and 42% of French men were either overweight or obese. Mm. Among French children, the obesity rate jumped from 5% in 1980 to 15%. In 2000. So that's indicating, you know, kind of a shift in the probably the diet and the eating patterns of people there because I think uh, 
McDonald's has their biggest set of franchises over in France now. So maybe they're indulging. Oh, wow. Yeah, that'll definitely do. And then the popularity of Starbucks, that can't help things with all the drinks that are 800 calories and have whipped cream and sugar and all kinds of nasty stuff in them. Yeah, it says here, France is now McDonald's second biggest market after the United States. In all manner of prepared and frozen foods, from cream puffs to filet de sole, amandine, fill French supermarket cases. So in other words, a lot of processed food and so forth. Yeah. So what about this paradox? Do you think that it's a result of them eating differently or eating different foods? I think it's a combination. And one thing that is not really taken into consideration here is, what are we comparing? The country of France to the U.S.? Or are we comparing just people in Paris to the entire United States? Because when you have a city like Paris, people walk a ton. So you're going to be burning a lot of calories just walking around. And uh, you know, if you're comparing that to, let's say, like the general middle of the U.S. or even areas that um, people spend a lot of time in their cars, it's uh, not really a fair comparison. But having said that, there's a lot of good that's coming out of this French diet and this uh, French way of doing things. And I thought I'd just read some of the bullet points from the book. Um, There's a site here that has uh, kind of an overview of what the book's about, and then we can talk about them. Sure. So, according to French Women Don't Get Fat, French women, one, drink water all day long. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good thing, staying hydrated. Uh, Consistently choose their own indulgences and compensations. What do you think about that? Yeah, a certain pattern of eating that is indicative of awareness of what foods do, right? So... They're using moderation as a way to indulge in various, you know, pastries and dessert type items, I would imagine. Right. And when you go to France, everything is in really tiny proportions when it comes to those type of things like pastries and bread and all the carbs. But the compensations thing is that doesn't that sound like rewards? Compensations. So I'm not sure where she's going with that, but yeah, yeah, if you're using something as a reward for dieting, I don't know if they really look at the way they eat as a diet itself. I don't think so. It's just more of a lifestyle that they have there. Yeah, exactly. So the next thing would be plan their meals in advance, think in terms of menus, and enjoy shopping to create healthful meals. I don't see any problems there. Then don't snack or eat mindlessly. Pay attention to what they are putting into their bodies. Well, I have a little bit of a problem with that first part. It says don't snack or eat mindlessly as if those are one and the same thing. Snacking is good. Snacking is definitely good. I mean, I'm eating five to six meals a day and uh, continually eating. And it's just what you eat. It's not uh, because I think that most people think of the traditional snacks. When you think of snacking, people think of like M&Ms and potato chips. And yes. those are, that's the problem. It's not the snacking itself. It's what you're eating in those snacks because it's good to not go hungry for long periods of time. And isn't it funny when you look in the grocery store, like the snack section will be all these processed foods, the chips, the cookies, all that garbage that is not very nutritious right. and contains lots of carbohydrates, which means lots of insulin secretion. And it's going to be really hard to snack on that stuff and maintain your ideal weight or to lose weight for that matter. Exactly. And, you know, snacking, I mean, I eat a lot of almonds. I just actually was right before our podcast, I was crunching on some almonds and those have, what is it on the glycemic index? It's uh, zero. Yeah. It's zero carbs practically. I mean, they have yeah. a lot of fiber too, so that's good. Right. Yeah. They're filled with nutrients and they have, uh, you know, the fat as the component. And a lot of people are leery of that because they're like, oh, too many calories. Right. But it's the kind of calories that you're eating. That's the big issue. Yeah, exactly. So the next thing would be enjoy dining as much as dining out and love to entertain at home. Well, that's good. This usually you can weigh your proportions out at home a lot easier than going out. People tend to go out to eat and they, they eat it all and then they get dessert and then they get drinks and pretty soon they're eating like 1500 calories in a sitting. Yes. And the servings that they serve, like you're saying in France, are smaller than in America. Exactly. Yeah. And even if you go out to dinner here, it's actually restaurant week right now in San Diego, so it's a good time to do this. But if you go out to eat to the nicer places, you actually get smaller portions. So the, the more expensive places, the smaller the portions. It doesn't make really any sense, but that's kind of something to keep in mind. You know, if you're going out to cheap places, you're going to get big portions and not as healthy food. Sure. 